Hey, just a couple of housekeeping items. No prayer today. We're going to try and get our service over a little early so you can get home, beat the worst of the heat. And I certainly don't want you traveling across town 5 o'clock, the hottest part of the day. So we'll not be gathering at 5 o'clock for prayer, but pray at home, either at 5 or later on today. And um, we want to do that in the interest of keeping everybody safe and healthy and all of that. Also, um, Tuesday, we're going to look into a part of the Bible that's not in your Bible. It's a gap. In the New Testament, there's a period of 400 years. They call it the silent years. We're going to talk about that because those years were not so silent. And when you realize a few things that went on during those 400 years, it makes you read the Gospels and what Jesus does and what people are doing in the New Testament in a totally different way. And so I encourage you to bring your Bible 6 o'clock. We'll probably be meeting in this little room right to the side because the cool is very nice in there. So uh, Tuesday. We'll be back in business, and speaking of back in business, I want to say thank you to everybody who's been kind and prayed for me. I have been about as sick as I've been, as I can ever remember being, uh, but it was all my own dumb fault. I didn't listen to good counsel, uh, I didn't go to the doctor in time, and I let myself get run down and too sick, and I knew better, and of course I was a bonehead, and I paid for it. So. But I'm about 75% back, and uh, I'm going to do my very best never to go that route again and take a little bit better care of myself. So, again, thank you for your kind prayers. Deliberate strangeness. That's what we're calling this summer series, deliberate strangeness. And I'll tell you why. Because I have a feeling that there are things in the Bible that are strange, but they've been put there in a strange way deliberately on purpose. I think there are things in the Bible that are strange because of a reason. And I think there are a number of phrases in the Bible that are strange. We're looking at some of those phrases. Things like eyes of the heart, go the extra mile, fight the good fight, pearls before swine. One I read just yesterday in Ecclesiastes Fly in the ointment, bite the dust. Those are all in your Bible, and they're funny phrases. And I think they're deliberately strange, and they're deliberately strange so that you'll look at them and say, what did you just say? And go after it and try and unravel it. I think there's some deliberate strangeness in our Bible. We're going to look at a passage. You may want to turn there, Matthew 4. We're going to look at Matthew 4 and a deliberately strange phrase but it is clearly in a chosen, deliberately strange place that it takes place. There are a lot of pictures, illustrations, paintings, ink drawings, even movies that talk about what the author Philip Yancey calls the showdown in the desert, the temptation of Jesus. When Jesus, the ultimate good, clashes with the devil, the ultimate evil in that awful place, that lonely place. And in a lot of the pictures, even a lot of the movies, it's easy to spot the devil in the story because he's got bat wings. The Bible never says not even one time that angels have wings at all, although that's one of those things that we all know the Bible says that the Bible doesn't say. It never says anything about angels having wings. It talks about seraphim having wings. Those are a very special kind of angel. That's, those are throne guardians. That's why in the first Indiana Jones movie you saw on the Ark of the Covenant, there sat two cherubim with their folded wings facing each other, guarding the mercy seat, the throne of God. And that's why those nasty Nazis got zapped when they opened it up, because those seraphim are throne guardians, and they are described as having wings, but angels... The Bible never says anything about angels having wings, yet we all seem to think they do. And so when there are pictures, you always know the angels because they have feathers. Feathers good, membrane bad. <laughs> and so the pictures always have the devil with bat wings. But there is a movie version that leaves out the bat wings that I think is very good and displays this showdown in the desert very well. 
Jesus is there. He's been there almost a month and a half, not eating anything. He's in a lonely place. He's in a waste place. He's in the wilderness, the desert, the dry place, the unholy ground. That's what the desert always is in the Bible. Because it's a place of chaos, it's a place where the ugly spirits have reign. It's a place of desolation. It's a desert. And Jesus has been there alone. It says in one of the Gospels that he has to contend with wild beasts. And in this Gospel, Matthew 4, chapter 4, it says that when Jesus was led by the Spirit into that place, that unholy ground, that desert place to be tempted by the devil. It says when he was led, the actual original wording, ek balo is the original wording. It means he was flung out there by the Holy Spirit because this is the opportune time for him to face and come to this showdown in the desert with the enemy because he's just been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And so full of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit bum rushes him out into that encounter. It says verse 2, chapter 4 of Matthew, and after he had fasted 40 days, no food, and 40 nights, he became hungry, no kidding. And the tempter, and that's what the devil does, the tempter came and said to him, if, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. That's the challenge he will face three times in this showdown. If you are the Son of God. It's just dripping with sarcasm and doubt, isn't it? If you are who you say you are, who you represent yourself to be, and in this encounter it will all be on the line. Mystery and miracle and authority will all be on the line here. If you are the Son of God, he says in this one, then why don't you command these stones to become bread? Because I, I know you're hungry. And I know in the physical you want to eat. We always think Jesus had a leg up somehow because he's God in the flesh, but he's still in the flesh. And he's as hungry as you would be after 40 days. He's starving. He's ravenous. And that temptation is a very real one because he could. He has that authority. He could do the miracle. If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, it is written. Jesus always goes back to the written word. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. In this deliberately strange place, he says that strange phrase, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And, and I just have to tell you, what Jesus is saying here is not original with him. Does that mean he's a plagiarist? He lifted it? He's a fraud? He's a copycat? No. He's a rabbi. And he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8 where it says those very words, Man shall not live by bread alone. You need bread, but not bread by itself. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of God's mouth. That's what will sustain us. And Jesus is quoting that. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I want, I want us to take a minute. The first part of that is famous. Man shall not live by bread alone. We'll come around to that. But let's look at the second part of that first. We'll live by bread alone. No. You'll live by every word of God. You know what that's telling us? It's telling us several things, but one of the things it's telling us is that you know the Word. You know the Word. It's not a stranger to you. We talked today about lived experience. That's kind of a phrase now. Lived experience. It's kind of a curious phrase to me. It's one of those phrases I'm not quite sure what they're digging at. Because if you've lived through it, you do have the experience. I don't know that you can have any experience that you didn't live through. I can't see how you would. So it seems kind of too many words to say one simple thing, but lived experience is what we talked about now. I think what they mean by that can very 
be very easily understood by anybody that's been a kid and climbed a tree. Imagine a kid who finds a tree, a, a good climbing tree. I always told my girls, look for a climbing tree. And now I tell the little kids that. Go look for a climbing tree, one that you can get a toehold and a handhold and a leg up. The kid finds a climbing tree, and he climbs up that tree higher and higher, out further from the trunk. He keeps finding good branches, good places to sit for a minute, good places to find another handhold and pull a little bit further out and up. And he does. But he reaches a place where there's not a good place to rest. And he slips or the branch breaks or, or he bends it or his weight is too great and he falls and he hits the ground in pretty short order. That kid is never going to forget what it's like to fall out of a tree. That's his lived experience. That's what I mean when I say you know the word. It's not know like you know the multiplication tables. It's a different kind of know. It's, it's an experience in life. That kind of know. That's what I mean when I say this story is telling us that you know the word. You've heard that phrase. It's not what you know, but who you know. And it applies here. I'm not talking about a what, I'm talking about a who when I say you know the word. Who is the word? Jesus is the word. He's your friend. Your friend is the living word. This book is the written word. He is the counterpart. He is the living word, and you know him. You know him. There's a monumental chapter, chapter 1 of John's Gospel, and it has a lot to say about Jesus as the living word in the beginning was the Word, and that gospel is intentionally starting the same way all of Scripture starts. Go back to Genesis 1.1. You've got it memorized. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here's that phrase again. John uses it throughout his gospel. It's a favorite of his. Here he says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. So we're not talking about a what. We're talking about a who, when we talk about the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the living Word, and you know the Word. All things came into being through Him. There it is, a Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that's come into being. He was the conduit that created everything. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness didn't comprehend it. Later on in this great chapter, verse 14, and the Word became flesh. You know the Word. And dwelt among us, and we saw His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. You know the Word. It's not a what, it's a who. You know the Word. And the word, he inspires you. There's a wonderful passage in one of Paul's letters, 1 Timothy 3, where he talks about the word of God. And he says, the word of God is inspired. You know the word pneuma, pneumatic. An air-driven drill is a pneumatic drill. You get pneumonia. It's got to do with your, with your breathing and how it gets fouled up, your respiration. It's the same word. The word says that all scripture, all the word was inspired. It's God breathed. It's pneumatic. It's God breathed. And you know why? Because another place in the Bible tells us that the word of God, again, not a what, but a who, the word of God is quick and powerful. And that describes Jesus to a T. He's fast. And he's powerful. Not it, but who. The word inspires you. He inspires you. He breathes in you. The word is inspired. And it inspires you. See, your best thoughts come from him. Your best behavior comes from him. The best directions, the best ideas... It all comes from Him. He inspires you. 
He breathes into you. That's how I know you know the word, because he inspires you. And it's by his breath that you live. He lives in you. This word lives inside of you. I love that verse that says Christ in you. Christ in you. Jesus isn't out beyond Pluto somewhere. He's not busy in Albania or the Middle East. He's in you. He's choosing to live in you. You know, there are two sides to the cross. You know that. We, we spend most of our time talking about the one side, and it's a beautiful side to the cross. It's all about forgiveness and mercy and grace and him pardoning us and paying the penalty and taking it for us, dying on the cross for us. That, that forgiveness story is a beautiful story about how he brings the runaways home because he forgives us. That's one side of the cross, but we spend most of our time only talking about that side. There's another side to the cross that's even more beautiful. It's Christ living his life in you. He not only forgives you, he lives in you. He can live anywhere he wants. He lives in you. He's living his life as you. He's living in you. That's what it means to know the word. The word lives in you. The living word, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the other side of the cross. It, mean, it means it means something. It means something to you, for sure, that Jesus lives in you, but it means something to everybody you get next to. Anybody you're around, because Jesus lives in you, it means something for them too, you see. In a crowd in the grocery store, when you go see a friend in the hospital, you take Jesus with you. Because he's living in you. He inspires you and he lives in you. That makes it meaningful, meaningful not just for you, but for everybody you're ever around. Jesus is in you and he can touch them as well. Why? Because he's living his life in you, you see, everywhere you go. One of my favorite passages, Acts 17, Paul goes to a place called Mars Hill, the Areopagus. It's in Athens, the seat of learning, the, the home of philosophy and wisdom, worldly wisdom. Plato and Aristotle and all the rest have made their mark there. He goes there, a very religious city, but a very lost city at the same time. You can be both, by the way. You can be very religious and be very lost, and this city was both. And he goes to the pinnacle. You've seen the pictures of the Parthenon, that great Greek building, part of it still standing. He's standing in the front of that very building. And he begins to talk to the people about the God who is there. As he's walked up to the top of that hill, he's seen hundreds of idols, representations of different gods and spirits that govern these people's lives. And some of them are ugly and awful, gruesome. He sees one, a, an, an idol dedicated, it says, to the unknown God. And he seizes on that and he says, the unknown God. The God you don't know, that's the one I'm here to tell you about. And he begins to present Christ to them. And he tells them this living word can live in you and you can live in him, Christ in you, you in Christ. And the way he describes it is so beautiful. He said, in him you live and move and have your being in Christ. He lives in you and you live in him. That's what it means to know the word, the living word. And finally, he encourages you, this word that you know. Some of the better love phrases in the Bible have to do with how Jesus encourages us. I love it when the word says he will never cast us out. He says that to each and every one of us. I will never cast you out. You approach me, I will never cast you out. As I, as I, as I told the people last month down at Living Hope, those people living in very desperate circumstances, 
I was so pleased to tell them that what it means when Jesus says, I will never cast you out, one of those favorite phrases is it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. But I'm a great sinner, I'll never cast you out. I'm an old sinner, I'll never cast you out. I've manipulated people and hurt people, I'll never cast you out. I failed my family, I'll never cast you out. I love that phrase. What an encouragement, I'll never cast you out. But there are more Jesus says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Never. Never. There's nothing that can take you out of his hand. There's nothing that can cause him to release you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He says in another place, neither do I condemn you. To, to the woman and to us. When people gather around and point their fingers and say, yeah, but you did this and you did that, and here's where you failed. And Jesus says, I, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. The word is full of encouragement like that. It's just full of encouragement like that. He encourages you. He inspires you. He lives in you. He encourages you. You can't deny it. One day they sent an officer, an armed officer, to arrest Jesus. The religious leaders had had about enough. He had shown them up in the worst way. He has power over evil spirits. They don't. He has sway over the people. They don't. He's an encourager. They aren't. And they've had enough, and so they send this officer armed to arrest him, to haul him in for questioning. And more is their plan. He goes, and as he approaches Jesus, Jesus is talking. Jesus always wants to be in dialogue with you. Jesus wants to be in continual conversation with you, so it's not unusual that we find in the pages of the Word, every time we find Jesus, He's talking. He's talking. Enter that conversation, friend. But He was talking. He was in mid-sentence when the soldier walks up to arrest Him with His handcuffs in hand. And He can't do it. Along with all of the rest of the crowd, the soldier is captivated by what Jesus says. And the report is that he is thoroughly amazed. He has never heard anybody speak like this. And he can't do it. He can't do the deed. He can't, he can't do his sworn duty. And so the arresting officer walks back to the authorities that sent him. And they say, why didn't you bring him in? I've never heard anybody speak like this never heard anybody speak like this. I've never heard words like this. And neither of you. Neither of you. You can't deny that he is an encourager. You can't deny that he will inspire, that he does live in you. His word lives in you. You can't deny it. And you can't live without the encouraging word of God. Live by the word of God. Man shall live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus is that expression. You know the word. But he mentions bread. You know the bread too. You know the true, genuine, premium, good stuff bread. Not the regular bread. You know the good bread. There are in the Gospel of John seven Phrases that are called the I am statements of Jesus. Seven times he says, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. The I ams. And every time he mentions one of those I ams, it enrages a certain set of religious people. When we say words from the Bible, to us, we don't often understand, especially the names, what we're saying. 
Nobody knows how to pronounce the name of God anymore, but when Moses asked, what's your name, God told him. And for a long time, people knew how to pronounce it, but after a while, it was forgotten somehow. They tried too hard to protect the name of God and lost the name of God. They can't pronounce it. People have tried to pronounce it Yahweh or Jehovah. or You hear different things. Those are just guesses. It's been forgotten. But what that name means is I am. I am. Not I was. That's God's name. Not I was or I will be. I am. God lives now. He's active now. He's concerned about what's going on now. That's why he doesn't worry about your past, and you shouldn't worry about your future. Now is where it's at. He's the I am. And when they would say the name of God, when Jesus said the I am statements, he was saying the name of God. And when the people heard it, they didn't hear a name. They heard I am. And Jesus says in one case, these seven I am statements he says, I am the bread of life. John chapter 6, you'll find it. He's surrounded by maybe hundreds of people when he says this. And they're talking about the bread that has come down from heaven. And he says, you know, I, I'm that bread. You know the bread, too. You know the word, but you also know the bread. This verse, this strange phrase, man shall not live by bread alone. You know the bread the good bread, Jesus is your bread. What's that mean? Bread, food. Food gives life, doesn't it? Food sustains. I heard a veterinarian one time, I'll just pass on his wisdom to you. He said, if a dog will eat, it will live. There's wisdom in that. It's one of the reasons I keep eating. I'm no different than that dog. As long as I keep eating, I'll live. So I don't eat because I'm hungry. I eat to keep from getting hungry, but I eat to stay alive. You eat to live. Bread is food. Food gives life. Food is life. I love what the Bible says. Passage in John chapter 5. Jesus is talking about some of these things. He says, an hour is coming and now is. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Just by hearing his voice, they'll live. I love the part of that that says, a time is coming and now is. When those that are dead will hear his voice and will live, they'll come to life. He's not talking about the sweet by and by. He says, and now is. That means he nourishes you now. He feeds you now. He's the bread of life for you now couple of weeks we'll gather around the communion table and that's what makes it so powerful that he sustains her sustains us it's a it's a reminder of that isn't it when you hold those elements he keeps me alive you know the bread too and the bread keeps you alive he's the giver of life somehow as we wrap this up somehow someday if it hasn't happened yet, Jesus will offend you. He calls himself a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And a lot of people will not allow Jesus to offend them. And what they do is they give up. Now again, someday, somehow, Jesus will ask you something. He will do something. He will say something to you. He will require something of you, and you'll be offended Maybe not about this, this whole issue of the bread and all of that. Maybe that won't offend you. It did offend people on that day. He, he told them, I am the bread of life, and you have to eat of me. You have to drink my blood. You have to be that intimately involved. You have to take me in. I have to live in you. Or none of this is going to work, and they were so offended. He grossed them out, and he offended them, and that may not be the issue that offends you, but something will. A church leader will offend you. A church member will offend you. A message will offend you. A song will offend you. Somebody's look will offend you. I have a 
a good friend. He's a brilliant guy. He's been a leader in our community. He's a good friend. And I love and appreciate him, but he has a serious, to me, a serious flaw. If something happens he doesn't like, he, he exits stage left quickly. Very recently I heard him say, if somebody in my church quotes from a certain book, there's a popular Christian book that's out there and it's doing a lot of people a lot of good, he didn't happen to like it. And he said, if somebody in our church, a church leader, would quote from that book, I'm out of there. And I believe him. Because in the time that I've known this friend, he has run from one church to another. He gets offended and he leaves. And he jumps churches. And he leaves behind confusion and wounds. People that care about him, he walks out on them. He keeps this up. By my tally, he's going to run out of churches pretty soon. Jesus will offend and many people quit. The world, this city is littered with Christians who have quit. Jesus has asked something of them. Maybe some of their money or their time or their talent. And they're offended and they quit. They leave. They leave a lot behind. There's a last act to this bread talk. It happens in John chapter 6. Jesus has said, I am the bread of life. And people have been offended at that. In fact, large numbers of people have quit. That was a bridge too far when he talked about being the bread of life and we have, have to eat him and drink his blood. And they're, they're offended by that and they won't have that. You've gone too far, Jesus. And so it says, multitudes have left him. A lot of people have walked off. They've quit. The kids say it today. They've ghosted him. They've ghosted him. They've left him. And he looks around. This great crowd is all left, and all he's left with is his original few. And he says to them, will you leave too? Are you going to leave too? Are you going to quit too? And one of them, as spokesman for all of them, says, Lord, where will we go? Where will we go? You only have the words of life. The words of life. Because he is the word of life. Where shall we go? Man shall not live by bread alone. The things that we can acquire on our own, natural bread. Man shall not live by that, but that's the very thing, and that's the very way that many lives are being lived today. All I need is my material needs met, because this is all there is, this is all that matters. If I get my education, if my kids get their education, if I acquire a skill that I can that I can make a living with, if I can make enough money, if I can buy a house, if I can have a car that runs, if I have enough food in the fridge and money in the bank and, and I have good clothes and I have shoes and appliances and a retirement and health insurance and, and if I can pay all my bills and, and maybe have a few extras, a motorcycle, say, or, or a fifth wheel or a pool or some jewelry or non-stick cookware or power tools or the latest smartphone or television, that's all I need. That's all I need. I'll be set. And that is based on a widespread but fatally flawed assumption that goes something like this, that I'm a human being. And if all You see, that's flawed because you are not a human being. 
having a temporary spiritual experience. You come into church on Sunday or you pray day by day or read the word and you have a spiritual experience. You're not a human being having a spiritual experience. You're a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. You're a spirit. You're a living spirit. You're an eternal spirit. You're not a human being having a spiritual experience. You're a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. And you don't live, and you can't live by bread alone. And to ignore the spirit side of things, to ignore the living word, the bread of life, to try and ignore him, is like trying to tie your arm down so that it's of no use to you, or, or strapping your leg up, bent, so that effectively you've got only one foot and one leg that you can use. You're handicapping yourself. You cover your eyes so you can't see. That's what you're doing if you deny that you need something beside what this world can offer. We need the living word. We need the bread of life. We need to let the spirit of Jesus flourish inside of us. So we come around full circle. Our goal for 2023, whatever you do, know God. Know God. Whatever else you accomplish this year, whatever else you, you rack up in the success column, know God. Make sure you know God. Make sure you know him better. And here's the thing. Knowing God is the most important thing. And Jesus makes it very easy. I want you to stand with me. You know the word. You know the bread of life too.